Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Byung Kim. I'm president of Korean Culture Society of Boston. And welcome to artist talk. And in fact, <clears throat> the last presentation in the artist talk series by uh, Jong uh, Nim Kim. And we are really fortunate to have Professor Song Nim Kim, <clears throat> who moderated the artist talk series in the last uh, four weeks. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Professor Kim uh, earned PhD degree in from UC Berkeley and is currently associate professor in Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And she uh, does research on pre-modern and early 20th century Korean art and culture. And in particular, she is uh, specializing in the history of the middle class, the role of the middle class people in production, distribution, collection, and consumption of arts in the 18th and 19th century Joseon Korea. She received a prestigious Korean Studies grant from the, the Academy of Korean Studies in 2020. And she also authored two books. Um, the first one is Flowering Plums and Curio Cabinets, The Culture of Objects in Late Joseon Korea. And she curated a traveling exhibition on checkery, uh, books and things in U.S. museums in 2016 and 17, and authored and co-edited the exhibition catalog, Checkery, the Power and Pleasure, pleasure of Possessions in Korean Painted Screens. So without much ado, without any ado, <clears throat> let me introduce uh, Professor Song Min Kim. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, for your kind introductions. And please, um, welcome to our fourth and the last series of artist talk. And today I'm very pleased to introduce um, uh, the artist, Jung In Kim. Uh, Kim is a fiber artist who is currently active as an artist, educator, and freelance designer. And Kim was a resident in the textile studio at Harbor Front Center and has been teaching in the textile department at OCAT, that is Ontario College of Art and Design University since 1997. Um, before um, any further introduction, I would like to introduce her on video link. Let's Oh, you are in a fiber studio, I don't care. Hmm. The fiber has been very um, favored by many artists in many different fields. Even Installation or fine art or sculptors. I've seen a lot of explorations in fiber, not necessarily by fiber artists. In our program, we have surface design program and also weaving part, which is a constructed fabric. So we do basket trees and weaving and tapestry. And also the third one is more experimental fiber which is a concept driven and also fabric manipulation. And more uh, recently, the exciting one is <laughs> so we can print on fabric directly from the printer, which is the most exciting uh, new baby we got. Uh, we had a project with our second year students in conjunction with the stem cell conference here in Toronto in June. All the pieces are exhibiting it now at Ontario Sciences Center until mid-October. Okay, 
So um, Jung Im Kim was born in Seoul, Korea and received her BFA and MFA at Seoul Women's University. And Kim immigrated to um, Canada in 1990. Throughout her long career, she has worked um, as constantly to achieve a balance among her interest in design art and education. Over the past 10 years, Kim initiated and conducted 15 collaborative course projects, as we saw in the video, with institutions such as Vaycrest, Toronto Western Hospital, Ontario Science Center, Women's Shelter, and Link Community, to name a few. Kim appreciates the opportunities to connect with communities through these projects using her own artistic interact, uh, interest with studies in with nature, science, and medicine. Please uh, mute yourself um, during the uh, artist presentations. And as an active studio artist, Kim has exhibited her works nationally and internationally, including Korea, Canada, United States, um, England, Poland, Belgium, Australia, France, Italy, and UAE. And recently, she um, participated in the exhibition called Negotiating Diaspora from the Personal to Universal, curated by Jessica uh, Rivers at the Onero Gallery in Ontario. So without much um, further introduction, I would like to welcome um, artist Jung In Kim. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, well, well, I just saw the one of the artists talk at just before, and then I was just so excited to be uh, included in this talk. And thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this Korean Cultural Society in Boston. Thank you so much. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. Just uh, give me a second, please. Is it working okay? Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Chung Im Kim. Uh, I was born in Seoul, Korea, as uh, uh, Professor Kim introduced me. And um, I studied there. I finished all my teeth, uh, studying and working a little bit. And that until my mid 30s, I was just struggling and uh, I felt like my career didn't go anywhere. I didn't know what I'm doing. And also at the same time, um, you know, in Korean culture and then women in mid thirties not getting married. And there was always a pressure. I really hate that part. So I decided to move to Canada. The reason I chose Canada was because my parents were here. So it was easy for me to come here. At least I have family. So I decided to move in 1990, but not necessarily as for becoming an artist or going to school and continue, but I just wanted to find me and just something new, new life, I guess. So that's how I came. So I start thinking and okay, when I, I give a talk and where do I begin? So I wanted to start 1998 to 2000. I spent three years in the residency, a textile studio at Harbourfront Center in Toronto. Um, Harbourfront Center is an organization uh, have a lot of uh, programs for promoting arts and culture and education and also recreation. And it's a really exciting place to be. They have uh, four different uh, studios and textile is one of them. And uh, a lot of uh, emerging artists wanted to come in uh, being a res uh, do a residency there. Even though I was a little older than other people and I considered myself as new. And for eight years since I moved to Canada, my struggle was 
about my language problem and learning new culture. And, and I started also working as a freelance designer again with the commercial designs. And so start working, creating uh, designs for neckties and uh, uh, designs for fabric and or designing for uh, area rugs and working with a fa uh, home decorators. But that was a part of me, but I really wanted to start all over again as a fresh new. So I joined the residency and uh, from there, I wanted to share with my work. Even though I was frustrated in the Korean tradition, but ironically, after eight years living in Canada, what I really crave for was the culture I missed so much. I left in Korea. Um, you know, when you were in that, in culture, I didn't really look at it closely. And then after I moved to Canada and I realized what I missed and then I really value what I learned when I was there, when I uh, grew up there. So I started looking at um, our culture, there's a music and dance and the Minhwa, like uh, previous artist um, and her Minhwa uh, interpretation was so amazing and uh, spiritually and her conceptually, but I'm a very tactile person. I was trained in, as a textile artist and I really have to touch it and making it. So I was just start looking at it in that direction and also looking at the Korean culture, um, women in Joseon period, particularly uh, women were quite oppressed. And, and in your lecture, Sang Nim, and I learned something <laughs> from the last lectures and uh, you know, there's a Yang Ban, Jung In, Sang Min, and, and from maybe Jungin to Sangmin, mostly probably Sangmin around ordinary people, they wore white clothes. So in Joseon period, and the Korean people were even called uh, Peggy Minjok, meaning people wearing white clothing. And as a an textile artist, and I look at it a slightly different way. Dyeing cloth is a very difficult thing. And in those days when uh, synthetic dyes were not available, natural dyeing takes a lot of time and money. So only, not even Korean culture, even European culture, uh, wearing deep dyed red, although the color I'm wearing is a synthetic dyes, but the real cochineal or matter, these dyes and only available for high class with money and power. So in the Peggy Minjog and the people wearing white clothing, and that's something came to my mind. And also the shape of Hamburg, uh, I'm not sure everybody knows, and uh, some of you uh, didn't know, Korean um, dress, women's dress or men's dress, Hamburg, the sleeves in around here, it has a wonderful curvature. And the socks and for Korean socks was, actually two pieces of uh, linen or cotton cut out almost like a, a Christmas sock here. <laughs> you know, those are sock when you hung and similar to, but it has a toe, a very pointy toe. And it, that kind of characteristics, it gave me an, an idea and I create this wall piece. And uh, this is the industrial felt and the handmade felt, it's all off white and screen printed and the little bead when you look at uh, from the right and these beads are images, the cloud image and these uh, little beads, it's all cloud image in a way I interpreted in my own way. I made a ceramics um, mold and cast and then I made this piece. So uh, this one is uh, kind of oppressed woman's um, the sorrow or Han, we call it Han, kind of release it. And it's oppressed, oppressed feeling, but also through this piece, I hope I wanna give them some freedom too in my mind. And the next piece is um, more 
like a celebration between uh, red and blue, which is a very significant color in Korean uh, culture for marriage. Having a man and woman and all this gift and, and everything, it has to have a significant color um, presentation, red and blue. So in this piece, it's more like a celebration of marriage through uh, the spirit of a Korean culture. That's what I wanted to express. And at the same time, and um, as you probably noticed, most of my materials and I'm using uh, here is industrial felt, which used for mechanical uh, things inside of mechanics or for installation and uh, the soundproof kind of thing, but not really uh, made for artistic material. But when I was still in Korea after my uh, graduation uh, from the college, I had a chance to work with a group exhibition. And in this group, we were introduced to this wonderful material, which was uh, industrial felt and so many different thicknesses and densities. And it has a really wonderful uh, properties for creation in my mind. And so, it was a long ago, but I still had that wonderful memory. So when I studied at Harbor Front Center uh, after eight years long period, blank period, and then I researched for the material and I found this company in Mississauga, that's how I, I began. And from the cultural um, inspiration to adapting new culture, and then I wanted to kind of combine them in my own way and also my struggle with the language and something I always felt stupid because I just couldn't express what I feel. And that was my kind of main struggle, but also at the same time gave me uh, some uh, inspiration. And in this piece in the middle on this silk, and it has the, a written poem by Dylan Thomas, but it's, uh, not so much of uh, to read, but it's uh, my way of just uh, looking at language in an English and also, and how do I express myself in an English and, and how much time do I need it? And when I read Dylan Thomas, uh, some of the poems, it really spoke to me. So that's how I interpreted it in my way. And also at the same time, my interest of 3D, uh, started with this material. Uh, I've been working at, at trained as a textile person, always the silk and cotton and dyeing and screen printing. And, but it's always so flat. It didn't give me an excitement and more and more, I wanted to create something more three-dimensional uh, form. So I started experimenting of these pieces. And also nature is always very inspiring to me. So collecting twigs and leaves. So in this case, just playing around with the thickness of different felt and twigs and printing and dyeing, which was my strong background of education. And in this piece, my first big um, three-dimensional piece, um, it's part what I pick up from the field and from it, I was inspired. And you would see later on that my current pieces kind of there's a, some kind of similarity and the history of uh, the progression of my work. The background is industrial felt and like the other pieces, these leaves are all handmade felt, hand dyed and stitched machine stitch, hand stitching, most of my work and a very simple techniques. And then after that uh, three years of uh, Harbor Front Center and during that time I started working as a freelance designer and I did a lot of designs and uh, creating yardages for Catholic churches, for priest robes and altar covers and wall hangings for the uh, Catholic churches, those gave me money uh, to survive as a bread and butter 
but for my own work. And I really wanted to continue on and at that time still in uh, Korean culture inspired and wanted to look at Bojagi. This piece is not mine. This is a historical one, but one of my favorite and it doesn't have embroidery and not so much of embellishment, but most humble and also at this time it has a structure and a wonderful um, juxtaposition by the colors and, uh, and it's not so uh, repetitive. It's a really wonderful and it's uh, one of my favorite. So I wanted to share this one. And at the time and before this part of my work, it became very um, personal around that couple of years, I became very, um, I don't know, uh, just missing Korea, I guess so much. And uh, my father already passed, that time passed away. And my mom was very close, <clears throat> excuse me. But this one was uh, my mom and dad's wedding photo. And they lived in North Korea, the North side, not North Korea, before a Korean War, they got married and they had two children and they escaped from North Korea to South. So I haven't met my uh, grandparents both sides at all. And nobody knew um, the North and South will be separated so long. And they were married in North side, just north of DMZ. And, and my mom was still alive. And it, when I made these pieces, uh, my mom was around the uh, 80s and my father already passed. So I had this uh, opportunity for the uh, exhibition and the, uh, the gallery was long and have a wonderful two walls, both sides. So I want, I separate them from the wedding photo and they recreate individually. And I installed both sides. They were looking at each other and I made it really large. It's so uh, bigger than life size. Like I said, and everything is so personal in those days. And uh, I was just working around from uh, family photos and my mom and dad, it's 1960. I was only five years old and just getting uh, removing the photo of my mom and an instead that I kind of produced her um, silhouette by stitching. And this is another photo and just emphasizing my mom and my younger cousin. And this is my photo and I played with um, a lot of technical thing. And also at the same time, um, when I left Korea, um, one of my friends gave me a book about uh, Kyubang Shilok or something like that. And it's about a, in Joseon period, it was, uh, kind of textbook like a teaching women uh, how to be a good wife and how to take care of your house well and all kinds of technical, uh, practical information plus, um, yeah, and uh, teaching women. And those days women were not allowed to go to school. So they were taught at home. So, and also when I read those um, texts, it was very difficult to discern. And it was an old language, Korean language, and the contemporary language is quite different. So I thought it was also quite interesting the way I struggle with a new language, which is English, and also my own language, but it's in an old form and it was still very difficult to discern. And I thought it was also interesting so I was to start using those texts in my work. And the left one at the bottom, it's a screen printed image that's called the Hojok, which is the um, lineage of clan. So this section shows at the bottom the name here. 
So um, this is my brother's name and my name, and my younger brother's name, and this is my father's name. So it has that lineage here. And interestingly, in this Hojok and women or not, when they get married, it was not really considered so much in importance and always follow the man's clan. It kind of also, yeah, another thing I wanted to explore too. But this is my brother's face and, and this one, oops, sorry. And this, the right one is my mom when she was young. So these are the, the family photos I work with, they are uh, all Korean traditional uh, cloth. So my sister still lives in Korea. So when I uh, exploring that idea, actually I really wanted to use the same cloth uh, common in Korea. Uh, the name is in English word, rami or hemp. In Korean word, moshi or a bay, and there are many different quality and different color. And some are sun bleached, some are really raw, and some has own color. But I love that subtlety. And in my mind, it is really beautiful. And underneath in these lines are, in my uh, interpretation, it was kind of universal language that everybody can understand by heart, maybe not by the meaning of each word. Maybe I should just stop talking about my frustration with the language. And uh, some of the pieces and um, working with the natural dyes, which is uh, chiza, which is a famous, uh, in Korea, we use a chiza to make yellow dye in here. We can do a lot of goldenrod. Now it's gonna bloom very soon. In Ontario, it's gonna be covered that that will make yellow. And onion skin, the onion skin we cook and that gives really wonderful yellow or uh, there are so many uh, yellow color you can use, but anyhow. And also at the same time, I also loved Minhwa um, and I particularly love this, uh, the dialogue in between uh, this clever uh, magpie and a little soft uh, cat-like uh, tiger and their conversations. And that inspires me a lot. So I made many uh, series and I included just the two pieces here. And this is, uh, one of those um, Pujagi series. And I'm not sure uh, how many of you really know about Pujagi. And there's a very particular technical skill you need to learn, but that's not what I was interested in. So I never uh, uh, wanted to include the technical skills in my Pujagi series. And those are not my concern, but what I really want to work with the, the spirit of uh, making Bujagi and using some remnants and irregular pieces put together and make something meaningful or useful. So I played around. These are the, uh, those are squares I work with. And also at the same time, you know, a lot of textile artists interest in the mending you know, cloth never stays forever. When you wear it, it wears down, it makes a hold, especially pojagi, uh, the, uh, these the, uh, moshi or these the hemp and linen, they are not strong in the many years and it wore down, especially moshi, this rami, and it's all mended. And they are very interesting in that way. It's changing and it has that, uh, the spirits, a person who wear it, and the history of the, uh, the person somehow. And living, uh, taking care of my um, aging mother, I was able to gather some of the old clothes they wore in their lifetime and 
they start stop wearing and still in their closet. They didn't know what to do. So they donated those pieces to me. So I um, undid all the hem individually, very carefully, and I reconstructed another yardage with it. So creating more uh, spiritual yardage. But this is not old one, this is just a new cloth and I dyed and made a new piece. So those were my um, Pujagi inspired period work and very uh, traditional and cultural aspects of Korea is embedded in my own work. And there are many artists out there who work with these ideas. And then after that, I started becoming a more interested in going back to my earlier interest and in working with uh, three-dimensionality. But somehow of this uh, piecing together from uh, different pieces put together, creating something, that's a real fundamental uh, strong base for me to continue on. So around the mid 2000, uh, my husband and I, we moved to country home and it's, uh, from Toronto to north around one hour and 30 minutes driving north and uh, it, uh, very close to town name Cookstown. And I, I thought that there must be a lot of cooks living there, but it wasn't true. <laughs> but it's a very tiny, small town, but very near. So our address is there, uh, Cookstown, but actually we are in the middle of nowhere. And our neighbors, we all have 10 acres each. So it's really quiet. It's just perfect for two ne uh, nerdy artists, my husband and I. Uh, so suddenly I was surrounded in nature and I look at nature and more closely and more inspired. and doing, um, becoming more three-dimensional structure in my work, I try to, uh, the structure speaks more strongly than my surface or uh, interesting patterns or colors. I still use colors, but kind of I was in the middle of a transition and I was looking at uh, things differently. And also um, making some uh, small forms and how to work in a body, in a three-dimensional, when you wear it as a jewelry or body ornament. And also at the same time, it's just a moving. And something you could find in the field in your backyard. And these forms, I walked a lot of every day when I walk in the backyard and I pick up things. And sometimes if it has a very interesting structure, I start cutting them and study uh, the structure of it. And I think this was uh, my first piece in this series, and I am still working on this field uh, in this uh, uh, series. And this is very simple, it's industrial felt, the design I did in my sketchbook and digitized in Illustrator and Photoshop and to make it fit and screen print and hand stitch and the work becoming three-dimensional, the way I designed it. So um, at this point, when I started working in um, mid 2000s so or 2005, six, seven, around that time, I started learning digital technology and Photoshop and Illustrator. That really helps me to realize what I was thinking in a more um, fast way and before I couldn't do it really. I was thinking something, but very difficult doing it manually, but digital technology really helped me.
in the same way. And uh, this one is a quite large. So it's a very labor intensive work and to print this one and I have to, the size of screen of my body, the, the height and width, I have to use at least 11, 12 screens and printing. So it's quite intensive, labor intensive work, but I still enjoy stitching. And the right one in the, uh, the enlarged piece close up, uh, that's probably a very close to actual size of each piece. So when I do this uh, stitch, so uh, this one is uh, when you uh, stitch tightly, it's a button or stitch, but I do this in a uh, like a basket stitch and loosely. in the same way. And I designed this and digitize it and in Photoshop and to make it manipulate it. So each piece has a curvature. So when I stitch the uh, pattern has to meet. So it's a very technical in a way. It, the same idea. And also at the same time, and then I really enjoy um, kind of natural uh, phenomena. And when the, the water swirls or when you have a, a, the magnet and the magnetic uh, the movement, and those are, are very interesting to me and very exciting. So I used those imageries on my piece. So 2D and 3D, I wanted to have that some very strong tension in between. I wanted to play with it. And around this time, and I just wanted to adjust away from patterning and Instead, I wanted to kind of real strong contrast with a white felt, it's off white and dyed really strong color, the um, combination and the contrast in between. This one is, um, the colors a little bit off and I am sorry, I don't have a piece anymore so I cannot re photograph and I just cannot correct the color, but the, the off-white is a little lighter and the black is supposed to be indigo, dark indigo. I have a many uh, series in this tumse, meaning it's a crack and crevice. Around this time, around 2015, I, my doctor discovered I have a, irregular heartbeat and arrhythmia, <laughs> the name came from it, that, that condition of it, I, I'm okay. And I never have a really heart problem, but I was doing a general checkup and he found, oh, your heartbeat is irregular. Maybe we better check it out. So I did, and uh, but since then I've been doing every year, I do general checkup, but so that's how I learned this. Uh, name and I thought it was very interesting to me to learn about. And the, the heart test, actually this image from my heart test. And from there, I recreated and manipulated in Photoshop and I used it in this piece. And around this time and my work is a slightly changing. And until this period, all this is uh, the patterns in, I call this module, they are all done pre-planned. And then I make it uh, in Illustrator and Photoshop. And, but from here, I didn't plan anything. This one is very spontaneous. Maybe you could tell the way it forms. Around this time, um, 
I went to an exhibition. It's a shipwreck in a museum named Aga Khan. Uh, they specialize in Islamic culture and art. It's really beautiful, uh, small museum in Toronto. It's opened, I think around 10 years ago. It's a beautiful museum. They had a, some years ago had a um, exhibition about shipwreck. And when the ship sank, it was the vessel uh, bring thousands of ceramic bowls and jars and plates to Europe and it sank on the water and it stayed on the water several hundred years and it was all discovered and then they had a big show about it. And I was so inspired that one of those big jar uh, covered with the sea creatures living on top and this is a humble jar. It was not really significant anything. It's just a humble practical jar. But with the time, the changes and these creatures add something and it was incredibly inspiring to me. And it's not something intellectually thinking and creating conceptually anything like that. It's just the nature did it by change and by time it was really inspiring. And that inspires me working is something with this, this type of series. So when I do, I made a frame uh, board underneath, which my husband made it for me. And I start working. Okay, I have a general idea. In it. I want this sea creature growing in the middle of my port in, in the middle of uh, this uh, rectangular board. So I started working in this corner. And then as I go, it's like almost a puzzle or a chess game. As I make some form a stitching on, the next one comes according to what I did coming next. So it's a kind of interaction, almost uh, communicating uh, with each piece as I go. And it's always a surprise. Maybe it can grow something else if I do a certain direction in a different angle. So it was very exciting to me. And this is another piece as a series. So I call that a mutation. It's a very, very heavy um, indigo dyed piece. And also around that time, um, charu is a, uh, what is the English word? It's uh, like a pouch. And in when I was a kid and my mom had a lot of things hanging and drying and whatever you put things in that form, the um, it changes and kind of that kind of in a way as a mutation um, series and also the same time in my childhood and I start creating this piece. This is just off-white. This one is uh, dyed with a natural dye lac, which is, um, it's a bug, uh, like a cochineal. And I think people know more of cochineal is more famous. There's a really interesting story behind, but uh, what I more, uh, I'm interested in is lac, because lac has more orange in it in color. And so uh, I use a lot. And this is onion skin that I save every meal. I, whenever I cook, I save these. And these are a mutation series. This is also lac. And becoming much more um, kind of playful, droplets stuff. And this one is a gray felt and I dyed with a logwood which uh, gives wonderful purple tone. So uh, purple over gray, and I got this great color. And um, I'm very uh, approaching to the end. Uh, this is a, a skeleton um, I titled. Uh, a few years ago, my husband and I, we uh, went to uh, Texas 
we really wanted to visit Marfa. Um, so we had a wonderful trip in uh, uh, Big Bend Park. And there's, I found skeleton of this old cactus. And I was so inspired of that. And it's, this piece came from that inspiration from Texas. And this is uh, just most recent pieces. So I wanted to include last year. And this piece just finished. This is the uh, piece uh, going to the show. Uh, Professor Kim mentioned uh, the AE5, Asia Europe 5 exhibition starting in September in Finland. And you probably are uh, curious how I stitch my work. And uh, this is what I do. Every single stitch with my hand, crazy job. I still <laughs> love to do it. So I don't know. And my husband once asked me, do you know how many stitches have you done so far? So I don't know. You know, piece like uh, mostly quite a large pieces. Uh, I don't know, maybe million <laughs> pieces. And I would like to share maybe a few uh, photos before I finish. And this is where I live. And the left one, this uh, up on the hill, that's my husband uh, studio. A house at the bottom walkout basement, that's my studio. And this is uh, around this time, but not this year, it was last year. And we have tons of tons of uh, aged apple tree. And this is how we live in country home. That's my husband, Goofy around with a very goofy looking eggplant we found. Um, we, we plant a lot of things. And also I live with a wonderful textile artist. We have tons of tons of spiders. They are incredible textile artists. All in the morning with the dew and I can see incredible structures are built in on the ground and uh, over the plants. And it's, uh, yeah, they are uh, amazing. I think the best textile artist. This is my husband, my fellow artist. Uh, I'm a big fan of his work. Uh, his, he had a, a retrospective show 2017 at uh, Garden of Muse Ceramic Museum in Toronto. Yeah, so we critique each other a lot and uh, he's my inspiration. And uh, thank you so much. Um, that's my work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it was beautiful. And thanks for sharing um, the photos of your um, house, I mean, home and uh, husband and his work. Um, I have one question from our audience about your, the process of making the artwork. Um, do you pre-design in Photoshop and create fragments and stitch fragments together? Or what is the, uh, could you please elaborate uh, more on that? Sure, yeah. Um, if there's any pattern on it, and I drew patterns in my sketchbook separately, and also um, in a sketchbook, I roughly just drew the structure of the lines first, and then, I put it in the Illustrator digitally. I pre-planned for the each module structures. It's based on the rectangle or um, yeah, mostly. And then uh, I uh, using in Photoshop also manipulate the curvature. So once the pattern is done, I put my pattern already sketched on my sketchbook, mm -hmm. overlapping on top of each other in layers. And then according to my structure, I manipulate my pattern to fit into, I'm not sure if I can explain well, uh, because if you can see 
uh, my lines are not straight, it's all curved. That way I'm cutting off in the center, almost like a crescent. So when I stitch, the shorter section have to shrunk, had to shrink, and the longer section remains and becoming a peaks. Mm -hmm. So it start undulating. I That's see. how I do it. But, um, and I can't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't want to lose any image in between. So in Photoshop comes in, I can push my design toward the line. So I'm not losing any image. So it's a very uh, digital manipulation. I do many days sit down and doing it before I transfer image onto screen frame. So it's, yeah, manual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, there was a comment from Ed Herger in the Facebook um, says, I loved seeing the evolution of your work and your progress, lovely. So <laughs> thank you, that's good. Um, I would like to actually, uh, before I open the floor for q and I'd like to kind of share a short video clip about your recent exhibition, uh, Negotiating Diaspora, with, uh, and it will give us some idea of This gives a true color of kind of. Yes, <laughs> it has indigo blue. <laughs> I'm just out of curiosity, um, when you do like sewing, mm -hmm. what is it like? Um, do you, how, when do you do it in the morning or in the afternoon? Or do you play music, sewing? Or is it like a meditation? What is it like? Um, <laughs> Most like a podcast <laughs> and the music, yeah. Well, I guess it depends. Um, Obviously, I cannot watch anything because I really have to concentrate on what I'm doing, but um, music has been good. But lately, I do listen to a lot of radio uh, podcasts, which uh, we have in the CBC in Canada as a wonderful podcast, interesting subject. So I listen to that a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm totally silent. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, now, actually, I would like to open the floor for q and I'm sure um, you have many questions to Jung Kim. Yes, um, Leah? So I'm not sure I um, know how to ask this question correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to try to understand um, how you put it together, it, it, the technical aspects. So um, the mutation series, mm -hmm. do you not have any frames? Like even, uh, you know, it looks like you have even wire frame or something behind um, mm -hmm. to help you form. Mm -hmm. how, how, so is it just by stitching and manipulating the mm -hmm. surface pieces? Yeah. And to begin with, uh, the my material is not like a silk or a cotton. Mm -hmm. It the uh, industrial felt already have its own structure and strength. Mm -hmm. So that's a one thing. And also structurally, um, you know, when you are making garment and women's breast, and there's a dart, you cut out fabric in a kind of in a sleeve, right? And then when you stitch, and the breast kind of comes out to make it three-dimensional. 
<laughs> that's the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for waste. And then when you have that, mm -hmm. so that's the idea. That's where I got my idea. And, but instead of cutting straight and I'm cutting kind of curvature. Mm -hmm. So when I stitch and then I'll show you, I have a sample here just next to my computer, just one second. So this is my uh, new piece working. So these are the one stitched mm -hmm. together and um, just one more thing. So each piece is like this. So um, how does it work? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Let me figure out first. It's very confusing. <laughs> okay. So I always have a number in back. I number it. Otherwise, I have sometimes 200 pieces. They are all different. So if I don't have a number, I go crazy. I would probably spending hours making it to make it right. So, okay. How did you uh, get? Here we go. Okay. This one goes here. But <laughs> when you see this one, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it, it's carved. So when I stitch them and yeah. it becomes naturally, it yeah. peaks up, yeah. right? It's a very simple thing, yeah. and, but it looks complicated. When, when you do sewing, when you do sewing and you make a mistake, you get you get the undulation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how did how did you make the pattern on the piece you just showed? How did you make that pattern? You mean this pattern? Uh, in the, in the, on the fabric. On, on, the, the, in, on the felt. Yeah. I drew, I draw image uh -huh. on a sketchbook. Uh -huh. And then I digitize them. And in Photoshop, digitalize. And then in Photoshop, I can manipulate. So it's kind of technical. I'm a little good at in the computer manipulation. So, mm -hmm. so you can get that, transfer that pattern onto the fabric? Not directly. Oh, <laughs> I make a frame and screen printing. That's the end. The screen print. There you go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, now, do you always? Are, may I talk? May I ask? I'm sorry. May do I you, ask a question? Yeah. Uh, do Do you always use natural dyes? Is are, are all your colors natural dyes? Right now, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. But my all your pieces are not. So, oh, oh, earlier, earlier are not are not. Yeah, not I, natural dyes. I remember one the wet the panel that was red and blue. Yes, uh, signifying wedding, and then and then I there was red that that kind of went from dark to light. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how you do that. Uh, yeah, uh, those um those are fiber active dye. Uh, those are synthetic oh. dyes, okay. and I'm using a large table. Are you familiar with the dyeing? Yeah, those yeah. are dyeing technique. Uh -huh. And it's called the batching technique because uh -huh. my pieces are really big. So okay. there's no pot I can find to deep dyeing. So I'm using a uh, batching technique, which fiber reactive dye allows to do that. And I make a dye first, dye liquid, many different color tones I want. Uh -huh. Then I uh, cut the fabric I want and prepare my large table covered with a plastic mm -hmm. and put my felt on it and I wet my fabric first before I dye it and with some chemical treatment and then I dye and I cover with plastic sheet and I treat um, leave it around three days to naturally heal it fix it yeah. then I wash it well, so there is no heating process. Yeah. Some some parts were pale and some were darker. So it, it just happens naturally, right? Yes, and also no. Yes, <laughs> so no. I plan in some way, but when fabric is dark, you cannot really see the real color. So I have to um, use my experience and the judging by my uh, experience. And then I try to make it happen. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I just one one quick question. I'm sorry. Uh, in the bojagi, the strings hanging down. 
is that traditional, the strings hanging on the bojagi? Oh, no, no, no. Those are strings are my interpretation. Uh -huh. Okay. I yeah. Okay. The I, real bojagi pieces are really clean, well finished. Yeah, I see, yeah. I see a lot of strings coming down. Yeah, for me, I would love to share my process, which is my stitching, just leaving it loose. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. I love it. I love it. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I I have a very simple question. How yes, yes. are your hands and the eyes are holding <laughs> millions and millions of stitching? It must be really, you must be extremely patient. Yes, I have some uh, patience and the teaching all my life. I That's what I need to have, right? <laughs> Working with uh, students and, well, I don't know. I don't have a patience for knitting or crocheting. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I don't have that patience, but when I stitch, it's almost like a meditation mm. with the music or a good talks I'm listening and I can go on and on sometimes one, two in the morning and I can go on, but the next day it, it's, I have to suffer. That's for okay. sure. <laughs> yeah. I have a many injuries of my hand and that's, yeah. So okay. I do a lot of exercise, in my hands and, but um, yeah. That's part of a uh, profession, I guess, but I enjoy it. Yeah, that's the price you pay for yes. your ma masterpieces. <laughs> I hope it's going to be masterpieces. If I well, they it. look uh, like uh, masterpieces to me. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> are you, you are muted. So, Thank you for showing the, the little pieces. That yeah. really uh, helped me to figure out how you made it. Before oh. it was a mystery to me. I oh, thought I see. Somehow, somehow you just pull the fabric and then stitch it. Uh -huh. that, that was my uh, idea. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That way I just can uh, picture. <laughs> yeah. But the mutation piece, yeah. is it one piece? Uh, stretched on the frame and then added on of those. Yeah, some of the uh, clean part is just a fabric and uh, I just cover the frame I made uh, and the undulating sides, it's all cut out like other pieces. I see. Yeah. So on top of the uh, stretched fabric, you added on. Oh, the... No, actually there's a hollow, it's hollow. So there's no fabric underneath. I yeah. see. Yeah, I for see. that section is a hollow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Your work is just so unique and just beautiful. Thank you. We have time for one more question. If there is no other question, I also have one. Uh, uh, to me, it's just... Um, it was very interesting to find all the uh, titles were in Korean. Yes. Like Tumse and Charu mm -hmm. and Heori and Soyeongjuri. And is there any particular reason that you use a uh, Korean name for titles? Um, yes, uh, because Korean word is more uh, comfortable for me and it, it has to be comfortable for me. And um, at having title is always a struggle for me. It's not easy, especially in English. I still use in the English and uh, Koreans as well, but I'm not so much of a conceptual artist anyway. And also language is, is my problem always. I still feel I frustrated in speaking in English, but when it comes to Korean, it, it has much more warmth to me mm -hmm. and also uh, my audiences are in, in, in outside of uh, Korea and mostly North America or in Europe, um, mostly these days more in Europe. And when it comes to kind of these words, it creates a more mysterious kind of um, feel right. to it 
and somehow and also instead of pouch and taru it feels more right yes. and i feel good mm -hmm. i don't yes. know does it make sense <laughs> yes it does it's uh, not so much conceptual at all and i'm a very practical and tactile person and and i wanted to feel i feel comfortable with what i put so actually when i struggled my husband suggested me and don't struggle jang -yim. You, why don't you use your comfortable word? And it's just write it in English alphabet. And I thought, oh, you are so right. And I feel good about it. So I start doing it in many, many pieces. Yeah. Thanks Thank to you. him. <laughs> Thank you. Um, lastly, um, would you please tell us more about your upcoming exhibition, Asia Europe 5, which starts uh, from Finland? Yes, um, you know, actually I didn't know about this exhibition and uh, almost a year ago, I received an email from the organizer and artist from Belgium. And she invited me if I'm interested for the show. And this is a fifth uh, show with, uh, they are having uh, Asian textile artist and also European artists to put together. And the organizer herself, she's an artist and she sent me all the link and the previous artists to work. And I was so inspired and oh my God, I would be just happy to be involved in that. So she asked me several pieces if it's available, but unfortunately they are not. So I suggested I really wanted to be involved, but would you give me time to produce and we still have a time, lots of time. And she said, of course, and do whatever you wanted to. So I create those two pieces for the show. And it's studying in one of the museum in Finland. I forgot the name, it's very difficult to remember. And goes to another one in Belgium and probably after that it's go to Holland as well. It doesn't go to Asia, but just... I don't think so, yeah. But um, I was also involved in a, a show in Holland a few years ago, and then I went to uh, there. Uh, I also gave a workshop there, and it was fun, and I really hope it will. And uh, hopefully, if a pandemic is lifted, maybe I will go <laughs> to Europe and have some trip, and I'm going to be... Uh, retiring at the end of June, so I will have a lot of time. So I'm hoping, but who knows, right? We don't know anything in for future, near future. So I'm just see how it goes. But definitely the pieces are ready, so I'm sending them to. Yeah, wonderful. I hope you, you stay um, healthy and productive, and for the um, your European trip. <laughs> I hope so, <laughs> if uh, I can go, yeah. Thank you for um, coming to our um, artist talk series. And this concludes the, uh, uh, the series. And um, thank you, Korean Culture Society of Boston for organizing this wonderful uh, artist talks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>